Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Welcome to today's episode, The Tyler Family Story, 1790 to 2020, in three generations. Many history buffs and followers of the news have heard of the recent passing of Lion Gardner Tyler Jr., one of two of the surviving grandsons of John Tyler, who served as President of the United States from 1841 to 1845. Today, Lion Gardner Tyler's daughter, Susan Tyler, joins us to share stories and personal memories about her dad and her famous family. Welcome to the show, Susan. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Very thankful to have you. Susan, why is it that the recent passing of your dad, other than the fact that he is an amazing man in his own right, and we're going to hear more about that, why is it that his passing had so much interest to history buffs and also national news? Yes, I think it's because there's such a gap in the time line between just three generations. So three generations have pretty much covered all of American history. John Tyler, the president, was born in 1790, and his father before him was born in 1747. So there was a gap. And then John Tyler was in his 60s when Lion Gardner Tyler, which is my grandfather, was born in 1853. Then my dad was born in 1925 when his father was 72 years old. Uncle Harrison, dad's brother, was when he was born, um, his father was 76. So that's quite a, an amazing time span there. Yes, we, we actually leap back into history so quickly through so few generations of people. Right. And actually, as a, as a little girl, the ancestor that I was most interested in, and still am probably, I'm just fascinated by her, is Pocahontas. We're descended from her children. Of course, she married a, a Mr. John Rolfe. And I know as a little girl, I so wanted to be an Indian princess. <laughs> and I thought that was so exciting. So much more interesting than presidential and politics and all that a sort of history. But I, I just read something in a newspaper article that we may be the closest living relatives generationally to Pocahontas, which I was very excited about. <laughs> oh, that, must, that must have made you very, very happy. I also heard that you are also descended from President William Henry Harrison. Yes, through my dad's mom. She was a Ruffin, and then her grandmother was a Harrison. We're actually, we're not descended from President Harrison, but we're cousins of his, but we are descended from Benjamin Harrison, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Your family's just steeped in history. It really <laughs> is. I'm so glad you're a guest on our show. I'm so excited oh, about this. <laughs> I'm a real presidential history geek, so this to oh. me is just so much fun, and I'm so glad you're with us, but Oh, that's let, me, great. let me start by asking you about yourself. Where were you born and where did you grow up, Susan? Well, actually, um, I was born when my dad was getting his PhD at Duke. So I was uh, a Tar Heel. I was born in North Carolina in Durham. Um, but then we moved shortly after that to um, back to Virginia and then down to South Carolina to Charleston. And so I was really raised down there. It was just such a beautiful town. So I enjoyed being there and then went off to school, of course, and um, eventually became an interior designer. So that's sort of my life in a summary. <laughs> oh, that's very, very interesting. So tell me about your parents a little bit. When did your parents meet and get married? Well, let's see. Um, they were married in 58. They were introduced by uh, a dear friend of mom's who also knew dad very well and 
and she told dad to come over and meet the girl he was going to marry because <laughs> she had been a roommate of my mom's and down in Montgomery, Alabama when, when mom was working down there. And then mom had moved to Richmond. And so that's how they met. And, and dad said when they first had dinner together with their friends that they just didn't even realize, the, well, he said he didn't realize anybody else was in the room because he was just so enamored with mom. So they were right. <laughs> oh, he was smitten. He was smitten. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. So we talked about what an amazing historical legacy your family has. When you were growing up, did you hear stories from either your dad or your mom or other relatives about your family history? Oh, so much. Yes. Um, that's one of the nice things. Being an only child, I just had my parents as my contemporaries. <laughs> and so, you know, I would, of course, play with kids in the neighborhood. But I also enjoyed listening to my mom and dad just chat. And they would always tell me these wonderful stories. And my mom's parents, also my grandparents, I heard marvelous stories about their life and and it just, uh, I've always loved stories. And so it just fascinated me. I could just visualize them in the past and what life must have been like. And, and, and it, it's what gave me really probably the love for stories and, and for history. So in those stories that let's say your dad was telling, did he tell you about his early years of growing up and what it was like for him? He did. Um, I, <laughs> it's so cute. I um, heard dad say things about that. He uh, wasn't influenced that much by presidential things. You know, his life was pretty normal. You know, he lived in the country and they were on a farm. And so he had work to do and chores in the morning before school. He would tell marvelous stories of milking the cow and you know, all his various experiences. But so he said that other than he did get to meet some presidents in his lifetime, which was very exciting. But other than that, he really wasn't influenced by, by it that much. But he did hear from people quite often about presidential things. And he said he just heard too many of those when he was young. And I think he was about two or three, probably about three, a lady came to the door. He was, he was told the story. He was there at the door while she was waiting at the screen door. And um, she asked him if he was going to grow up and be president. And dad said, I'm going to bite your hate off. <laughs> with that wonderful <laughs> <Virginia accent. laughs> And she said, well, what are you going to do with the bones? And he said, well, I'll pit them out. <laughs> so he, even at three, he was tired of it. He was not going to be president. <laughs> he wasn't a public relations specialist at age three. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, dad said he really never enjoyed politics that much because, you know, the, he enjoyed the work that you did, but the running for office, you know, was, was just, it was not his favorites. Great. Now, so your dad, he had quite a extensive education. Could you tell us a little bit about that and his military sure. experience? Um, well, dad, he actually didn't go to public school until he was in um, fifth grade because he was homeschooled by his mom. She was a, a school teacher. And then he skipped sixth grade went, and finally went into high school and he got a scholarship to St. Christopher's Prep School. And he was actually 11 when he started high school, which is <laughs> just crazy. And then when he started college, he was 16. And then of course the war interrupted his schooling. So when he graduated, he was probably back on schedule as far as his age group. And then what happened with the military? Did your dad join the military? He did. He, it was, of course, World War II. <laughs> and one day he and some friends, they, this was when he was at William Mary. He had just turned 17. He and some buddies were coming back from one of the taverns <laughs> in uh, Williamsburg, going back to William Mary. And Somebody said, let's join the Navy. <laughs> had a little too much to drink. And he, they all thought that was a great idea. And he said, so fortunately, because they really didn't know all that they were doing, they signed up for the V-12 program. That allowed you to go uh, to stay in school for that year. And then you had 
two more years of school, I believe it was, and you go in as a um, an officer. So, you know, thank goodness they <laughs> they didn't know what they were doing, so they could have signed up for anything, probably. What kind of assignments or jobs or duty did he do in the Navy? Well, uh, that's the thing. It's an interesting story. He he signed up in 42, but he actually never saw, or he never got sent to the Pacific until 44. And what happened was he got the measles. And so his whole group was sent off to midshipman school and he had to stay at home quarantined. And so then when he finally went, he said he was like there for a week. He didn't have any orders. He didn't have any chores, you know, didn't classes. Didn't have, and so after a couple of days of that, he went to one of the officers and asked, well, why am I not in any classes or what should I be doing? And so they looked him up in the records and said, well, according to us, you're out in the Pacific. And so they didn't know what to do with him. So they ended up, he finished up a midshipman school in Chicago, and then he went to diesel engineering school and they just sort of transferred him around. So it was a 44 by the time he actually got into the war. One of the things, dad had a praying mom who was definitely praying for him. So he was so protected during the war. It was just amazing. And then he was stationed in China, part of the Yangtze patrol as well after the war. And then when he came back to the U.S., he was in the Naval Reserves and stayed, well, he was actually in Naval Intelligence, but then he went into the Naval Reserves and stayed in that until he retired in 65. I'm going to back up a little bit. When, when your dad was younger, he lost his dad when he was quite young, right? His Harry, right. The, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, Lion Gardner Tyler Sr. Mm-hmm. is his dad. So he probably didn't know him that long. Well, he um, fortunately got to know him a little bit better than his brother because Uncle Harrison was just six when his dad died. So he was still very much a child where dad has some lovely memories of, of his father telling him these, he called them Jack stories, that they were made up uh, adventures of Jack. And so every night when the boys were going to bed, he would come in and tell them these stories, which dad just loved. He, oh, and then also just some fun escapades that, you know, he got into as a child and he was always getting into trouble because of a particular cousin that (laughs) it was one of his best friends (laughs) uh, who later got kicked out of several colleges even for his pranks. (laughs) Oh boy. <laughs> so, one of those cousins, right? <laughs> right. So dad was always getting, getting in trouble for that. <laughs> so your dad's dad, your grandfather was the son of President John Tyler. Right, right. He was um, actually a, a, a lawyer like his father and then went into the state legislature again, like President Tyler. But it was during this time that he, um, they were actually, they proposing to shut down the college where we marry. And so he made a, a proposal to keep it open and he got it passed. At the time, they only had one student <laughs> and one professor. <laughs> so uh, well, he and, and four other gentlemen taught as well afterwards and kept the school going. He really was credited with saving it after, and this was after um, the Civil War, so not many people could afford it those days to go to college. And so he really, he saved it from being shut down. I tell you, I've been to William and Mary as a visitor walking through campus. What a beautiful campus that is. It's just- oh, it is just amazing. When I've gotten to tour uh, through the campus that dad's father was, uh, my grandfather was, um, actually president of the college for a while and lived in the president's home there. Dad's half-sister, um, Lion Gardner Tyler Sr.'s first children that, that were born um, 40 years before dad with his first wife, <laughs> who had passed away. She scratched her initials in the window with a diamond ring. So they're still there today. <laughs> so, no kidding me. It is. I wanted to talk about your dad's love of history. 
he did have a, a deep or keen interest in history. Yes, he really learned that from his dad. He said it just, it was amazing growing up with so many books around him. I think dad said he started when he was young, he would read the encyclopedia, but he said he never got past aardvark. <laughs> he, uh, you know, just when dad was grown, he and his brother donated to the college or women Mary, I should say, I donated 10,000 of his father's books. So there was just a plethora of books there that he enjoyed, you know, got to read over. And of course he didn't read that many. He said he wasn't even sure his dad had read all of those. <laughs> but <laughs> He didn't have audible books at that point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, having a mom who was a school teacher and a father who was a historian, Lion Gardner Teller Sr., also wrote um, uh, several books, one of which is, um, or two of which I should say, is The Cradle of the Republic, which was about Jamestown, and then also Williamsburg, the Old Capital, which is what John D. Rockefeller used in restoring the city of Williamsburg. So, and then of course he, he was also, he founded the William Mary Historical Quarterly, and he edited the Tyler's quarterly historical and genealogical magazine, which dad's mother took over after her husband passed away. And so, I mean, dad was just surrounded by historians. <laughs> Couldn't it, help rubbed it. it rubbed off on him. Then. It did. <laughs> Didn't your dad go on to teach history? He did. Um, it, his, his career consisted of, he was um, a lawyer for a while and then became a Commonwealth attorney, which is the same as a a DA in, in Virginia, um, in his home county of um, Charles City County. And then he got involved with the Civil War Centennial Commission and became their assistant director. He realized at that point how much he loved history. And so he went back to um, get a PhD in history at Duke. And then from there, taught at VMI with Virginia Military Institute and then at the Citadel as well for about 25 years, I guess, at Citadel and then retired from there. Boy, I would have loved to have been one of his students. Oh my gosh. Well, I, <laughs> I used to always ask dad, I didn't have to worry about, I didn't have to go to an encyclopedia or anything because I could just ask dad, which made it so <laughs> convenient. Uh, made uh, school projects, very easy. <laughs> but one time dad said to me, I asked him a question about some historical fact. And, and he said, you didn't know that? He said, I would have flunked you. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'd want to be in his class. <laughs> yep, maybe on second thought. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, but he was a wonderful teacher. He's just kids, and the students adored him. And he so often he would bring home students that were having a tough time, you know, for dinner or lunch and and um, just to encourage them. And well, I remember just funny stories as, as a young girl, you know, I thought it was so exciting to, first of all, have cadets, Citadel cadets come home to you for dinner <laughs> when you're a young teenager. And then also it was so much fun going to the Citadel, especially when I was younger, of, and having everybody salute dad and just the whole military school experience was was lots of fun as a child, of course, because I didn't have to go through any of the training that you have to <laughs> go through to be in the military. But <laughs> That's great. So let me ask you about your dad's, well, obviously when he was three years old, he didn't really want to hear about any president or anything like that. <laughs> right. He was going to bite someone's head off and spit them. <laughs> obviously he changed his mind a little bit. He got a little more interested in history. As a matter of fact, yeah. as you said, he became really, really interested in history. Tell us how he viewed his famous grandfather, John Tyler. Did he have any thoughts that he passed on to you and to others about what he thought about his grandfather? Oh my goodness, yes. In fact, dad so enjoyed giving speeches about him because of the character of John Tyler. And, and that was his main emphasis in his speeches that uh, John Tyler was known as Honest John. Often he's listed as not a very successful president 
which is what being honest <laughs> and always trying to do what he was considered right sort of gets you in trouble in Washington sometimes. <laughs> so his own party just hated him because he he wouldn't go along with you know some of the things that that they wanted him to do and either he felt well, he actually had a very Jeffersonian viewpoint of um, politics. He had actually been raised uh, around Thomas Jefferson, which I think is amazing. That uh, dad's grandfather, you know, was <laughs> that's insane. It's like it blows you know, your mind, not, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> I'm like, well, I remember um, dad talking about it that his great grandfather was John Tyler Sr. And he was Speaker of the House of Delegates. And well, first of all, I should say, he was um, Thomas Jefferson's roommate in college. So they remained lifelong friends. They had the same political views, of course. He formed a militia with Patrick Henry to fight the British in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. So he was in the Virginia legislature and he made the motion that led to the Constitutional Convention. Then later he was governor of Virginia. So he remained a dear friend of Thomas Jefferson's. They would get together quite often and play the fiddle. And um, I, I read one book that it said that he, that Jefferson had very few close confidants, but one of them was John Tyler Sr. So as I was saying, the president would have definitely been influenced by Thomas Jefferson. It's hard to go from Jefferson into the politics of the 1840s. So Susan, what was your dad's personal thought about his grandfather, John Tyler? Did he have any thoughts about, uh, you mentioned about his character. Were there any things that your dad specifically said about your grandfather that would support that thought that he had about him? Yes. Um, dad used to give a speech, which is I, I loved it was he would often use the same speech. Um, he has a few variations of it, but um, he had done quite a bit of research about John Tyler being the historian and <laughs> he wanted to be very accurate. Uh, I think the best way to really explain the character of Tyler is to look at one of his one of the stories that is about when he was a senator and he was fairly young. And he had promised the Virginia legislature that he would vote according to their direction. He came up across a situation where it was involving Andrew Jackson and Tyler didn't always agree with Andrew Jackson's sort of unauthorized, dad called it overreaction. Like for instance, the unauthorized invasion of, of Spanish Florida. And then I think he reacted to the South Carolina attempt to nullify the federal tariff. And when Jackson <laughs> um, threatened to hang John C. Calhoun, <laughs> the vice president. <laughs> so Jackson actually took the money out of the Bank of the United States two weeks before um, it was, the charter was expired, or a few weeks, I should say, before the charter was expired. And he put the money into state banks that were run by friends of his. <laughs> so the press called it his pet bank. So Tyler thought that was Ill illegal and wrong. Senate censured him and Tyler, you know, signed the censure. Well, then the Virginia legislature told him that they wanted him to join the movement of those that were going to rescind the censure. Well, he felt like he couldn't do that because you know, Jackson had broken the law. And so that would be wrong to rescind the censure. But at the same time, then he would have to break his word to the Virginia legislature and not vote, you know, according to them, their, their direction. So he um, actually decided to resign from the Senate since he, either choice was morally wrong to him. And he said, he made this statement with his resignation. He said, by this, and I'll read this, by the surrender of the high station to which I was called by the people of Virginia, I shall teach them to regard as nothing place or office when either is to be obtained or held at the sacrifice of honor. And wow. so President John F. Kennedy, 
who wrote the book Profiles of Courage included John Tyler for that act of courage. So Susan, your great-grandfather John Tyler clearly put his personal conscience above party politics. For our listeners' information, John Tyler was later selected by the Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison, to be his running mate in the election of 1840. They ran and won under the famous campaign slogan of Tippecanoe and Tyler too. The name Tippecanoe comes from a battle in 1811 in which William Henry Harrison had been a key military leader. On a cold inauguration day, President Harrison spoke outside for over an hour and a half without wearing a coat or a hat. Sadly, he came down with pneumonia shortly afterward and died exactly one month after taking office. Therefore, John Tyler became the first vice president to become president following the death of his predecessor. Right. Well, actually, the way it happened was the, or the way he was chosen to be uh, vice president was at the time um, Henry Clay was head of the uh, Whig Party. So they, the Whig Party had picked Harrison, of course, um, as um, the war hero from the Battle of Tippecanoe, as, we were talking, as you said. So he had fame and, and then they sort of threw in Tyler because he represented everything else that was opposite. <laughs> Of, of Harrison. So if you didn't like Harrison, you'd at least like Tyler and you know. And so he did, he was called his his accidency and um, oh he was just ridiculed and and uh, really as, as dad said that he could have had an easy road um, and been deemed a very successful president if he had just gone along with everything. But because he stood for his principles and what he thought was right, he would not play politics. <laughs> sort he, of. he didn't want to play politics. He wanted to vote what got he, him in big trouble. Right, he wanted to vote what he actually believed. And right. when you when you said they called him his accidency because he became president because Harrison died, I think at the same time he thought he believed he became president. He was going to act like a president. And that there were some, right. I think, maybe in his former party or other parties who thought that he was just an acting president, that he wasn't president in his own right, because this was a, right. a first. I'm going to vote and of course, as a president. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course, he, uh, having been raised around Jefferson, that was very much, you know, what Jefferson espoused with the Constitution was, you know, the, the president was elected by the people. And um and then, you know, the vice president was supposed to take over and, and it was not to be someone else that, you know, running things behind the scenes. Yeah. A couple final things on John Tyler. One is we talked in the beginning about how there's such a huge age difference between John Tyler and his younger children. And then, of course, some of those, your grandfather and the age difference between him and your dad. But right. can you tell us about John Tyler and how he ended up having a family at such an advanced age? Can you tell us about his second wife? Well, absolutely. Um, his first wife died when he was in office, actually, um, Letitia Christian. And then all historians would know about how, how he met Julia Tyler and um, her father was a senator and and there was a, a disaster that happened on board a ship and, and a cannon had blown up and her father had been killed along with a number of political leaders. And John Tyler was on board ship at the time. And so was Julia. Supposedly he carried her off. She fainted in his arms and he carried her off the ship. And, and uh, I think it's, she was taken back to the White House to sort of recuperate. And so I don't know how long she was there, but they, you know, got to know each other fairly well and they eloped not too long after. And she was only uh, 25 and he was 50. So that's quite a, an age difference. And then he'd had eight children by his first wife and then seven children by the second wife. And so that sort of was a lot of children. <laughs> He's had that's a more lot children, children than the president. That's right. 15 total. Wow. Susan, do you have any last thoughts about 
your great grandfather, John Tyler, that you would like to share? Well, I've got some wonderful quotes that were said about him. Um, one that particular I, I like is um, that Henry A. Wise said, an honest, affectionate, benevolent, loving man who had fought the battles of his life bravely and truly doing his whole great duty without fear, though not without much unjust reproach. Then also John Tyler wrote these words on, on the grave marker of his horse, General. And it says on the marker, he never stumbled. Would that his master could say the same. There's some humility for you. <laughs> That's great. So Susan, <laughs> your dad, as far as his impact on you, can you reflect on how your dad and how he lived his life impacted you? Oh, my goodness. Dad was such a wonderful man, just so loving and, and generous and kind. Um, I've had more friends of his and more people that knew him tell me that he has changed their lives in some way or form, um, that either through advice or um, helping them in situations, he started, oh goodness, he, he started prayer groups for the students at, at the Citadel and well, even professors that said they, their lives had been changed because of dad and his influence. Oh, I think one of the things too is that I'm always amazed at that exemplifies who dad was. And he attended, he was Episcopalian, um, cradle raised Episcopalian. <laughs> and um, he would attend the youth group at, at his church until he was 85. He was the token sort of grandpa <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the youth group. And they all just adored him because he had such a good sense of humor and, and just so loving. So I was so blessed to have such a fun and, and smart <laughs> dad. I always like to brag on as far as his smarts that when he went to Duke University, he got was 4.0 average and a uh, member of the Honor Society Phi Beta Kappa. But he did his master's and PhD in three years instead of the five years. And his dissertation, his professor said it was the best he'd ever read. <laughs> so I loved it. I always used to brag on that because dad would never have told anybody that. And of course, he wrote his dissertation on civil defense, which in the 60s was very much a thing of concern. And that's why he ended up teaching at military schools because they were the first ones to hire him, you know, um, because of that. And, um, and then also his military background as well. Susan, how would you sum up what you believe your father would have wanted his legacy to be? He most of all would have wanted people to know that he loved God and that Christ had changed his life. He had had a, an experience with God in his 40s actually what what happened um when dad was at duke university um getting his phd mom had an accident we were all actually having a picnic and we were in the field and this pretty field they'd stopped uh, the car and gotten out and and mom was playing with me and chasing me and there was some high grass there and she didn't see that there was barbed wire in it so she actually ran into it and cut her knee open. They had a medical kit in the car and mom was clenching it and, and um, onto her knee and hold, stopping the bleeding as best she could. And so dad rushed her to Duke. When they got there on the way, mom, well, first of all, on the way, mom had been saying, okay, Lord, I've just learned about healing and, you know, that I can believe you for healing. And she then she um, thought about it a few more minutes and finally said, you know, either I believe or I don't believe. And then she said, I believe and made that decision in her heart. And so when they got there in the, the, the hospital and dad said, well, let's take the gauze off so we can see if you need a wheelchair or if you can walk in. And he removed the gauze and he said there was no cut. There was no scar. It was just perfect, like, you know, baby flesh, just nice and clean. 
And he was so shocked. And he said at the time he was in the middle of his dissertation and he thought to himself, now, I don't have time to deal with this. This is a miracle. <laughs> he said, but I will have to think about this later after I finish my dissertation. And so then, but of course, then he did think about it and he um, it changed his life. You know, he, he started just following Christ. And so um, just, I remember so many times that mom would ask dad to have a little Bible study in the evenings and we would sit down and, and I would maybe have been going through something that week at, you know, sometimes even little silly teenage things, you know, that dad didn't know about. Um, he would take a few minutes and flip through the Bible, picking out what verse to read or what to read. It would always, it seemed like be just exactly what I needed or whatever I was going through. And of course, dad went on mission trips and just had a lots of amazing stories and miracles that had happened in his life. And so that to me, of course, is dad's number one legacy. Number he one wanted one everyone to, to know, know Christ. Well, thank you for that. It, just from talking about your dad, it just sounds like he was a vital person. Aww. Really, it sounds like you felt that he was a man of great principle, brilliant man, and somebody who wanted to help others. So I'm, I'm only, the only thing I'm sad is that I didn't meet him and that I Aww. wasn't interviewing both of you at the same time right now because I would have loved to have met him. I'm not sure I would have wanted to have been in his class uh, as you <laughs> no, said, right. he have failed me, but <laughs> well, <laughs> I would have liked well, to have no, met I don't him. Think he wouldn't have failed you, he would have loved you. <laughs> oh, well, I just want to ask one quick question now. Your uncle, your dad's brother, and right. his, his name is Harrison Ruffin Tyler, and he's still living. Where does he live now? Well, he's actually in Richmond right now in retirement community. Okay. So because unfortunately he has had a stroke. He and dad both are so sweet. Uh, Uncle Harrison is always, when I would talk to him, he would always say, like on the phone, he would say, well, how is the beautiful Susan Selena doing today? <laughs> uh, just so dear, even, even with dementia, both he and dad have just, dad was so sweet and so grateful always. Um, and even um, like if I was buttoning his collar, he would kiss my hand, you know, because it was close by and, and to his face and and he would thank me for taking care of him in the same, Uncle Harrison's the same way, just so precious. But he had before, of course, lived between Richmond and then the president's home, Sherwood Forest Plantation. Sherwood Forest is the name of the home of President Tyler, and that's still in the family. Can people visit? I know with COVID going on, it's probably not as easy to do, or if at all, but is it a place that people can visit in the future? Well, I hope they can visit even more so in the future. Right now, of course, because of COVID, it's for the grounds only are open. But as soon as everything is, as soon as we get the vaccine or uh, whatever, um, they're going to be able to open it back up for private tours. You can call and make an arrangement to visit. Um, it's a complete museum and, and decorated according to the period with lots of Tyler memorabilia and it's just quite amazing it's actually the longest frame house in America because they would sort of add on it's colonial style and they would add on to it so hopefully soon it will be open back up well I'm going to be looking for for many reasons for this whole COVID thing to end but one of the oh one of the things I'm going to do in the future is to get down to Sherwood Forest and visit because it sounds like a really really cool place to visit and I hope that you will give your Uncle Harrison my best if you speak to him or see him. Susan, I want to thank you so much for being on our podcast. And you're just a delightful person. And you've been willing to take the time to share the really full and interesting story of your family. It's just been amazing. Well, it's been a joy to be with you. Goodness, I've had so much fun. So Susan, stay well, and we hope to talk with you again soon. And for our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.